All right, take your Bibles. I hope you're still there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And as Callum said, it is a, uh, there's a lot in this chapter. I'm going to do my best to cover most of the thoughts in this chapter. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover everything. Let me just check if this audio stream is working. Looks to be okay. All right, so the title of the message tonight is found in verse number 12 there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, let's look at verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. The title of the sermon tonight is Build Upon This Foundation. Build Upon This Foundation, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Obviously, I would have preached this on Sunday, but being sick, it was, it was a blessing that Jason was able to get up and give us an emergency backup sermon, which I appreciate. Preaching this, this chapter... Uh, this week, and then on, th on Sunday, I'll be preaching chapter 4. Okay, so we don't miss a, miss a beat. We're still going chapter by chapter, week by week. But build upon this foundation. Now, let's look at verse number 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. Now, if you guys remember chapter 1, Paul having a good go at this church, having a go at the Corinthian church, because they had divisions among them. Do you remember that? There was a lack of unity. There was, there was strife. There was divisions because they were following man. And this is what we find here is that he repeats this in, verse, in chapter number 3 that you guys are babes in Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a babe in Christ, obviously. Let's read number, verse number 2 for a minute. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet, yet now are ye able. So, Paul's saying, look, you're babies, you're carnal Christians, and I've got to feed you with milk. You've not progressed from the point of having milk. Right? When I first came, you guys remember in, in Acts chapter 18, we see Paul come into the city of Corinth. He starts winning souls, preaching the gospel. This church is set up. He's there for a year and a half, preaching boldly the word of God. Okay? Obviously, at that point in time, for a year and a half, he's preaching the milk of God. Then he leaves. We, we see later on in that chapter that Apollos comes through. He goes through Corinthians. And that, that's why these people know these men. And some have favored Paul. Some have favored Apollos. But this is many years later. Paul is writing to the church and says, you're still babies. You still need the milk, right? And like I said, there's nothing wrong with being a baby. You know, we have a newborn baby. He needs mother's milk. He's not going to be able to have the physical meat. He's not going to be able to, able to have the deep, uh, well, the, the, the food that he has to chew on, right? A baby needs a milk. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, and from time to time, as this church grows, you know what? I'm going to have to go back and preach some of the milk. Why? Because we're going to have new people in the congregation that may not know certain truths, you know? So every now and again, having a, a bit of milk with your meat is a good thing, okay? But the problem with this church is they hadn't gone past that. They were still babes in Christ. They were still uh, underdeveloped, okay? And they had put these men on a pedestal. You know, I ask you, you know, the, the, the good thing about this book, right, 1 Corinthians, is that this whole book is the milk of the Word of God. This is where we get confirmation from Paul that I'm writing these things to you because you still need the milk. You're not able to take the strong meat. And I know, you know, we might think of ourselves as mature believers, but still this church, you know, as, us as a whole, as a united group, we're still, in, in a sense, babes in Christ. In a sense, okay? And that's why I think it's so important to go through this book so we can move on from this at some point, right? We can move on from the milk and get onto the meat uh, that God has given us. So please be patient, you know? Please be patient with new believers when they come in and they don't know much and you're kind of like, oh, we're we talking about this again? Like these very foundational truths, these, these things that are the milk of the Word of God. As mature believers, you know, it ought to give you delight to feed the babes in Christ the milk that they need, right? But it is frustrating. It can be frustrating, and we'll see later on that it can be frustrating when a church has not grown past the milk of the Word of God, right? It's frustrating when you've been in a church for years and you're like, I'm not learning anything new. It's like, well, I mean, it's, it seems like we're just learning the basic things again and again. God loves you. You know, God's gracious toward you. We know these truths, but when you hear it week in, week out, you get to a point where you grow as a mature believer and you're like, I need more than that right? I need more than just the milk. And I've been in churches like that where it gets frustrating. You're like, come on, just give me something else. Give me the meat. Give me the potatoes besides 
just the milk of the Word of God. And like, be patient with new believers, but also be patient with our church. We're a new church. This is a new endeavor. I'm a new pastor. I'm learning things as, you know, things develop and th- as things go. You know, we can't expect the church in Caloundra to be at the level where a church has been for 5 or 10 or 20 years, right? I mean, unless it's a dead church, we'll probably catch up to them pretty quickly. But a church that's been serving the Lord, that's been preaching the gospel, doing great exploits for the Lord, don't expect that we'll be able to do that, what are we, four and a half months into it, right? You know, so be patient. Be patient with the church as well. Be patient with me as we, we learn uh, these things. You know, I think it's important that we do cover the milk so we can then progress onto the more important things as we mature in the Lord, not just as individual Christians, but mature as a united church. Now, it's not good, obviously, to be obviously all the, t- all the time in the milk of the Word of God. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. I just want to show you one other group of Christians that are being reprimanded for being babies. Turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Now, obviously, you know the book of Hebrews. Who's that book written to? To the Hebrews, right? To the Jewish believers in Christ, okay? Now, turn to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. We see this other group, this group of Christian Hebrews that are also being reprimanded for still being babies. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, Paul, and I believe Paul is the writer, is the author of Hebrews, uh, even though the Bible doesn't ex- explicitly say that, but it just a lot of the, the same t- words that Paul says, the same kind of teaching, same kind of, of um, it just seems like the same author to me. I think most people do agree, generally agree that it is Paul. But uh, verse number 12, for when, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, so Paul is saying to these Christian Hebrews, you ought to be teachers. All right? Because why? Because when Christ came, he came first to the Jews, right? Then the Gentiles heard the gospel. So these Hebrews would have been some of the first to have believed on Christ. And, he's, and Paul is saying to you, you ought to be che- teachers by now. You ought to be teaching the word of God. You ought to be that way. But then he says this, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of, strong, uh, not of strong meat. So we need to, you've had the milk, you've grown, but we've got to go back to the milk with you. You ought to be teachers by now. This is embarrassing. This is embarrassing that this group of Christians have not grown past. And it's a little bit of a different story with the Hebrews because they were struggling with letting go of Old Testament practices. They were struggling with, with, with uh, moving on to the New Testament and, and fully understanding all the types all the foreshadowing that took place that represented Christ. They wanted to hold on to some of those things and they were struggling with that. That's why they were babes. A little bit different to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church were babes because they were idolizing men, whereas these guys were trying to hold on to their old ways, you know, rather than, than accepting that the New Testament has come into play and that Christ was the fulfillment of all the things that they were doing in the Old Testament. Uh, verse number 13, Hebrews 5, 13. For everyone that uses, useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So, if you're someone that wants to preach behind this pulpit and wants to be a teacher, you've got to show me that you're not just a baby, a baby anymore, right? Otherwise, you're not skillful to use the word of God. I've got to see some maturity in you. I've got to see some wisdom in you before I allow you to come and preach behind this pulpit. Now, obviously, any babe can preach the gospel. Uh, you know, if someone gets saved today, I'll take him today to knock doors and preach the gospel, right? Because that's what they know. They know how they got saved and they can communicate that to a, a non-believer. But I'm not going to get someone that's just been saved to preach behind the pulpit, preach to the church, right? We need people that uh, pass that milk. And obviously, you know, because sometimes people get offended. Like, they're like, I've seen this in other churches. You know, why haven't I been asked to preach? You're a baby. <laughs> you need to grow. And, it, you know, you don't, it's not a bad thing because you are a baby. Like, you, like, it's not a bad thing that Samuel's a baby. He's drinking milk right now. That's not a bad thing, right? We're not going to get him to come and preach, you know, <laughs> behind the pulpit. It's not a bad thing. You know, it's not, it's, it shouldn't be something offensive. But if you've been a Christian for years and you're still stuck where you are, yeah, I mean, you ought to be teachers by now, right? That's what Paul is saying to these Hebrew believers. Verse 14, but strong meats belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's why it's important. It's because someone that's mature, that knows the word of God, can discern between good and evil. That means a babe in Christ 
cannot discern between good and evil just yet. They need to grow and know the Word of God even more so. Please turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But I just wanted to show you there that we can, we can compare these two scriptures and we can see how, you know, the milk is important, but we need to move on to the meat at some point in our, in our lives. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 the, uh, Paul says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying... So why are they carnal? What's the problem? Why is Paul saying they're carnal? There is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are ye not carnal? And walk as men? So Paul's just saying, like, you know, you're carnal. And it's like, agree with me. Are you not carnal? Because of these things that you have in your church. Verse 4, For while one saith, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Paulus, are ye not carnal? That is carnal. We, we've covered this in chapter 1. I don't want to re, you know, re-preach that same message. You, know, you can go back and listen to that again. But that was their major problem. They had elevated Paul. They had elevated Paulus higher than they ought to. Instead of just seeing them as great men of God that we can learn great things from, they had elevated to the point where in their hearts it was as though that Paul was crucified for them. In their hearts it was as though they were baptized in the name of Apollos. Okay, they were babes in Christ. Now, a couple of things that was wrong with them. The envying. So there was divisions among them. You know, they had the group that followed Paul. They had the group that followed Apollos. They had the group that followed Simon Peter, Cephas. And because they had these cliques and these divisions in their church, we see that one of their problems was envying. All right? That means they were bitter. One group would be bitter toward the other group for the, for the things they were doing. And, what, and the other group would be bitter toward the other group. There was envy. Right? Rather than rejoicing in seeing the great work that each group were doing, they were bitter toward it. Okay? it they weren't a united church. There was strife, meaning arguments and conflicts between those factions. Right? You know, Paul's better. No, Paul's is better. No, Peter's better. You know, fighting between these groups. Big problems in this church. Honestly, as you read through it, you realize, man, this church is really messed up. And then it says divisions. That speaks for itself. Uh, have, you ever been, have you ever been in a divided church? Have you ever been in a church where there are like, you know, these people do not talk to these people and they're fighting and, and then it's like awkward. It's like walking on eggshells. I, I, we experienced that a little bit in one of our previous churches where the ladies in the church were fighting and, uh, you know, this woman wouldn't talk to this woman. It caused one family to leave. And um, it was really hard for Christina, like, not so much for the men. Like, all the husbands of these women, we're, we're like, all best buddies. Like, yeah, it's all cool. But amongst the wives, they were just fighting, and they just couldn't get past it. And it just didn't seem like it was going to get slaughtered in the church. And like I said, one family left over it. And, um, you know, Christina was like, Do I talk, if I talk to this person you know, they get angry, and if I talk to this person, they get angry. It's, it's not a place you want to, you're like, you, you, don't, you don't want to be in that church. You don't want to really go. Like, you want to, you want to go to a place where it's a refuge. You know, you want to go to a place where you'd be uplifted, where you'd be edified. And when church is not doing those things, you really don't want to be there. When you're not, when you're le- not learning, and, you know, you're, you're worried about, you know, offending someone, that, that, that divided church is not nice. And this sounds like even, even more divided than what, you know, we experienced. But look at verse number five. Who then is Paul? Like, who am I? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. So Paul has the humility, right? He says, who are we? We're nobody. <laughs> right? We're, 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 all we are are ministers of the Lord. We've come to be your minister. What does that mean? Your servant. We're here to do you a service. We come here to minister to you. We're not here to be your Lord. And Savior, we're not here to lord over the flock. We're not here to be your great hero. We're here to serve you, is what he says, right? But ministers by whom ye believed. So some of us, Paul and Apollos, some of these people in the church were saved because of their preaching. And that's how God used them as a minister to be the soul winner which led them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says, even as the Lord gave to every man, meaning that, you know, the great work that they've done, the the great gifts that they have, is from the Lord. Like the things you're praising man about, he's saying those were things given to us by the Lord. Okay, the one you ought to be glorying is the Lord and not in the man. Verse number six, I have planted, Apollos watered. Remember Acts 18, Paul comes in, you know, he goes in first, right? It's a tough crowd, the Jews don't like him. 
He starts, he starts um, planting. Apollos comes later. He waters. But God gave the increase. God gave the increase. Okay? The work is the work of the Lord. And the Lord has used Paul and Apollos to grow this church in, in Corinth. Okay? Uh, Jesus obviously says, I will build my church. Okay? It's not my job. It's not your job to build the church. It's our job to be ministers. All right? Ministers of the gospel ministers to one another, but it's the Lord's job to add people to this church. And we ought to be praying for that. We ought to be praying that the Lord would uh, give us the increase in this church and give us the increase when we go out and win souls for Him. Verse number 7. So then neither is he that planteth anything. So he's, he just finished saying, I have planted. He's the one that planted this church. He goes, so then neither is he that planteth anything. That's what he says, like, I'm, I'm not, not anything important. I'm not anything important. Neither he that watereth. Who was that? Apollos. Okay? So, so these men that these, this church is idolizing, he's saying like, we're, we're nothing. We're nothing. Neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I love Paul's humility. I love how he goes to this church and says, look, you know, I'm just here to serve you. I'm doing the works of the Lord. I'm ministering to you. That's all I am. You know, outside of the Lord, we're nothing. Okay? Verse number eight. Now he that planteth, and now he moves on to a sort of a new thought, which is about soul winning, which is about preaching the gospel. Because, again, many of these people in this church were saved by their, by their work. Verse number uh, 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Pay attention to that. Okay? Remember, keep, keep the context in your mind. Who planted this church? Paul. Who watered? Apollos. Okay? Where was the division being caused? Because people were idolizing these men. Okay? But then what does he say about them? He says, now he that planteth, which is Paul, and he that watereth, Apollos, are one. Right? So he's saying, you as a church are divided over us, but I'm telling you, me and Apollos are united. We're together. And you're dividing about us because you're not having your focus on the Lord. But me and Apollos, we're good. We're one. We're working together in the Lord's business. Okay? But, uh, sorry... Uh, watereth, uh, sorry, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So Paul says, hey, yep, I planted, I'm going to get a reward for that. Apollos watered, he's going to get a reward for that. Hey, but it's the same work that we're involved in together, right? The same work that is the work of the Lord. There is a reward in doing all these things, okay? I know we get excited, I know we get motivated, I know we get encouraged when we do the reaping. When we see souls saved, and I know sometimes we get discouraged when we preach the gospel, we're out there two hours in this humidity, sweating, and no one's interested, or they get, you know, we get to give the gospel to a few people here and there, but they don't get saved. When you haven't seen someone saved week after week after week, it can get discouraging. But what does Paul say? There's a reward. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And what's the, what's the work they were doing? Planting and watering. Okay? If you don't see souls saved, hey, you're planting. Me and Matthew, we didn't have anyone saved today, but we planted. We have a reward. We have a reward in heaven. Okay? Someone else can come later on and water. Hey, it might be you again. You know, I've heard this interpreted, uh, he that planteth and he that water for one. It could be the same person. You might sometimes be planting, sometimes you might be watering, sometimes you might be reaping. You might be able to do all those things on the one day, right? But the important thing is, no matter what you're doing, as long as you're serving the Lord, as long as you're ministers and you're trying to preach, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a reward for you. There is a reward. It's not a waste of time. There's eternal reward for you in heaven. Uh, now, everyone receives their own reward. So, I want you to turn, leave, leave, obviously leave your finger in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Because remember, within these factions... There was envying. Okay, they didn't like what the other group were doing. Okay, envying. John chapter 4, verse 34. John chapter 4, verse 34. And this is obviously a, a pretty common, pretty popular passage. But it does, it, I think it fits in very, very well with 1 Corinthians 3. John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to, is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then come of the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth 
receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. So we saw if you water, if you plant and water, you get a reward. Jesus says here in John chapter 4, if you reap, you also receive wages. You know, that's, that's obvious. And gather fruit into li- uh, unto life eternal, uh, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. May rejoice together. Were these groups in this church rejoicing together? No, there was envying and strife. Okay? Envying and strife, right? The problem in that is that we ought to rejoice together, okay? Let's say, let's say Jason's our, 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 our number one soul winner. Let's say every week he goes out, he's like, oh, I got this person saved. Every week, got this person saved. And the rest of us are like, months, like, oh man, I haven't got anyone saved, you know? But should we envy? Should we be envious of that? No, Jesus says we rejoice together. And I'm glad we're in a church that does rejoice together, right? We come back on Sunday, such and such got saved. It's like, oh, awesome, you know, fantastic. We can rejoice in one another. That tells me we're united. That tells me we're of one mind. We care more about the soul being saved than necessarily who did it. Hey, it was our church that did it. We rejoice in that. It's one group. It's one union. No, not in this church, though. In this church, they had their divisions. They had their factions. They had their envy. Uh, and then verse 30, so, uh, you see in John 4, John 4, verse 37. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap... What, uh, that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. So this tells me that as the disciples, as the apostles of, of Christ were going out preaching the gospel, they were getting great success. They were reaping the harvest. But Jesus reminds them, hey, don't get all high and mighty about it, because you've entered into the labors of other men. Other men have toiled the ground before you went there. Other men have planted before you got there. Other men have watered before you got there. You've got it there. You've reaped. But don't forget, you've entered into the labors of others. That's why we ought to rejoice together. Okay? Jesus made sure that they understood this, whether that was John the Baptist and John the Baptist's disciples preaching that Christ was coming, or whether he's referring to the prophets of old. Whatever it is, God's people have been working even before Christ started his ministry. People were getting the fields ready for him. And when his disciples came, they were able to reap those harvests. Obviously, we see in the Bible hundreds and thousands of people believing on Christ and following after him. Okay, so uh, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. <clears throat> and uh, Christian, can you get me some water? Just fill it up all the way. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. So he says, I laid the foundation of this church, and another has come and built on it. That was Apollos. And I think Peter, okay, because Cephas was one of the guys that they were idolizing as well. But let every man take heed. So listen, pay attention. Every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. What is the foundation of the Corinthian church? The Lord Jesus Christ. What's the foundation of your life? It ought to be the Lord Jesus Christ if you're saved. What is the foundation of the church in Caloundra? The Lord Jesus Christ. Never forget the foundation, okay? Once you know the foundation, once you've built that, that uh, you know, I had a granny flat built, you know, in Sydney. The first thing they do was get that concrete foundation in place before they got the, you know, before they put up the, build work, the, the woodwork, before they did the insulation, before they did the tiling. The foundation was put into place first. The foundation was first. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to keep Him the focus of our work, Okay? For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, so we are required now, we are saved, you're saved, the free gift of salvation, believe on Christ, you've got the foundation. Now what are we to do? We're to build on it. Okay. Paul said he's a wise master builder. He builds and he wants us to build as well. He wants the Corinthian church to build as well. Now there's a few things we can build with. Verse number 12, gold, silver, precious stones, 
sounds really nice. Wood, hay, and stubble. Okay, the first three you can tell immediately are different to the last three. Okay, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, these things are highly valuable, very expensive um, items. And then you've got the wood, hay, and stubble. Very cheap, easy to access things. Now, on your foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to build with any of these uh, items. Okay, sometimes you're going to build with gold. Sometimes you're going to build with wood. Okay, this is your life. Okay, the, your life as a saved person, you're building on the foundation of Christ. There are going to be things that are wood, hay, and stubble, and there are going to be things that are gold, silver, and precious stones. And ideally, you're focused on the gold, silver, and the precious stones. But verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest. So every man's work will be revealed. Okay, all the work you do for Christ will be revealed. Not your sin. If you're saved, your sin will not be revealed. It's already been paid for on the cross. That's where it was revealed. It was revealed in the suffering of Christ. Okay? Not your sin, but your work will be revealed, will be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now think about this for a minute. If you have gold, silver, and precious stones, if you pass that through the fire, does it become more pure, or does it get burnt up? It gets more pure, right? If you want to purify gold and purify silver, you put it under intense heat, under intense fire, so that the reprobate silver <laughs> gets wiped away, and that way you're left with something more precious, more pure. But if you pass the, 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 uh, the, hay, the wood, hay, and stubble through the fire, is it going to become more pure? It's going to get absolutely destroyed. It's going to get burnt up, isn't it? That's how it's going to be made manifest, by the fire of God's judgment. Look at verse number 10. Oh, sorry. No, I'll, just, I'll, I'll read it to you, actually. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 10. It explains what this judgment is in a little bit more detail. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether, sorry, according to that he have done, whether it be good or bad. So this is called the judgment seat of Christ. Paul explains this in a little bit more detail in his second letter. But here where our works are going to be tested is called the judgment seat of of Christ. You're going to stand before Jesus Christ and he's going to judge the works that you've done in your body. Not your sin, but your works that you've done in your body. Okay? Now, have you, let me see a show of hands if you've heard of the Bema Seat of Christ. The Bema Seat of Christ. A few of you have heard it. It's the same thing. It, it's, first of all, you're not going to find the Bema Seat of Christ in your King James Bible, but the, that, the, the, going back to the Greek, Going back to the Greek, guys. The judgment seat in the Greek is called Bema. So if you've heard that term before, the Bema seat, it's the judgment seat of Christ. It's the same thing. It's where your works are being judged. Okay? Now, the context, the context of what we're reading is that Paul uh, uh, planted Apollos Ward. We're talking about winning souls. Okay? So obviously, one great way for you to build on the foundation that God has is for you to go soul winning for you to go preach the gospel, for you to go win souls for him. That is one of the main ways that you're going to earn your rewards. Okay? So, kids, honestly, you've got your whole life ahead of you. Some of us wish we started earlier, right, man? We wish we started earlier preaching the gospel so we can get maximum reward in heaven. You guys have this available to you. If you're young, you learn, you know... Uh, the gospel, the Romans road, or whatever it is, learn how to do soul winning. So as early as possible, you can go out and start earning those rewards of gold, silver, and precious stones so you can start building upon the foundation of Christ. Okay? Now, it's not just winning souls. Okay? You can win rewards. You can gain rewards in anything that you do as long as you do it in the name of the Lord. As long as you do it for the Lord. Okay? I'm going to read from you Mark chapter 9, verse 41. Mark chapter 9, verse 41. I'll just read it to you. Jesus says, For whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Now, my son just brought me this water. He's not going to lose his reward. Okay, that's what he started with, right? He's got the foundation of Christ, he's saved. He's offered me a drink of water. He's got a reward for that. So next time I get thirsty, if you want to get a reward, you can bring me a cup of water as well. 
anything you do for the Lord, if you're in your workplace, you're, you've got to have a, your, 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 your thought ought to be, I'm serving the Lord. Okay? Everything that you can do, you do in the Spirit, you do in the Lord, will ultimately get you a reward. Now, you can be doing some of those same works, but you're not doing them in the Spirit, you're not doing it for the Lord, you might be slacking off at work, guess what that's going to be? Wood, hay and stubble. Wood, hay and stubble. But if you do it for the Lord, it's going to be gold, silver and precious stones. But you want the big ones? You want the big rewards? Go preach the gospel. Go door to door, preach the gospel, see souls saved, like Apollos and Paul did, but do it as not boasting, do it as a minister, as someone that's serving their community with the word of God. Now, the thing that I want to just point out to you, and I'm sure a lot of you guys know this, but we're covering the milk of the word of God. The judgment seat of God for Christians is not the same judgment seat that the unbelievers are going to go to. Okay, Turn to uh, Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Just very quickly, just to tell the difference. Revelation chapter 20, every man is going to be judged by God. You know, when people say, only God can judge me. Well, God will judge you, okay? If you're a Christian, you'll be judged at the judgment seat of Christ, not for your sins, but for the work that you've laid up on the foundation of Christ. But the unbeliever, unfortunately, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, let's read it. The unbeliever will go before the great white throne, okay? So the great white throne is for unbelievers. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. There it is. And him that sat on it. If you're, if you're at this throne, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay? This is not where you want to be, okay? And him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Not even the earth and heaven can take in the face of God. And there was found no place for them. Verse number 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And I've taught this before. I believe the books that are open here is the Bible. I believe that it is the law of God that is being opened. Because a lot, these people have trusted, not in Christ, they've trusted in their works. They've trusted in them being a good person. They've trusted in them keeping the commandments. They've trusted in their religion. They've trusted in their baptism. They've trusted in their false gods, their false idols. Okay, they've trusted in science as, as far as evolution and you know, the Big Bang. That's what they've trusted in. They stand before the Lord. The Bible is opened and they're going to be judged. How well did you do against my commandments? And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, we're going to be judged according to our works, but what foundation is our works on? On Christ. You see, these guys do not have the foundation of Christ. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the end for them. They get judged at the great white throne, judgment. They're going to be found to fall short. They're not going to be able to, you know, uh, measure up to God's standard of perfection. Now, our works are perfect. You know why? Because our foundation is Christ. And then we're building upon that. We've got Christ's perfection. We have Christ's righteousness, whereas these people do not. And that's why they fail. This is why they're cast in to the lake of fire. Sad place for them to go, but that's the reality. You want to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Get saved, make sure you're at the right judgment, okay, not at the great white throne judgment. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So I just wanted to just differentiate there, okay, the two judgment seats. Don't get them confused. It's not the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 14. If any man's work abide, so after the fire passes through your work, if any man's work abide, which he have built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So, if your works were the gold and silver and precious stones, if after it passes through the fire, it's even more perfect than it was before, then you'll get your reward. You get your reward in heaven. Eternal rewards. The treasures in heaven. You know, when Christ says about laying up treasures in heaven, this is where your treasures are going to be given to you. A reward. Heaven is not the final objective, guys. Heaven is not the final objective. We get to heaven, free gift in Christ. But then we need to build upon that. Okay, we need to earn those rewards. Let's work hard and earn those rewards. We got the time now. 
We've got the time today, we've got the time tomorrow to work to these rewards. Why? Because when we get to heaven, we're not all going to be equal. Yes, we're going to be equally saved. Yes, we're going to have equally the righteousness of Christ imputed upon us. But some of us will have greater rewards than others. If your work abides, you're going to have more than the one whose work is burnt up. Okay? Verse number 15. 1 Corinthians 3.15 If any man's work shall be burned, so now this is the, the wood, hay, and stubble, okay? If those works are burnt, he shall suffer loss. What loss? The loss of rewards, okay? But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, I've, I've seen people struggle with this last bit where it says, he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. And um, I don't think it's that difficult to understand because remember, the fire is revealing, it's manifesting the work of that person, right? Now, if, if someone's saved and all they've done is worried about the earthly, all they've done is they haven't worried about the things of God and all they do in their life is lay up the wood, hay and stubble, then when the fire passes through, it's going to burn that up, right? But what does it leave? If, if, if all the rewards are burnt up, what's left? Yeah, the, the foundation. The foundation is left. And so, yet so by fire, it just reveals the fact that, yeah, they have the foundation of Christ. This proves that you can be saved and do no works for God. Right? We say, oh yeah, we know you're saved because you're doing good works. No! <laughs> right? Because this is an example of someone who has his works, their wood, hay, and stubble, no eternal value, Okay, he just lived for himself. You know, and he, um, these wood hands, they're not sins. They're just, he just lived for himself. He just did things that didn't matter for eternity. Okay? And yet it's all burnt up. But yet he, he himself shall be saved. Why? Because of his works? No. Because of his foundation. His foundation, which was Jesus Christ. That's why he's saved. You can't judge someone's salvation by their works. The unsaved do good works. In fact, there's probably more unsaved people that do great works compared to many Christians that do nothing for the Lord, who do nothing for this earth. We know they're saved because they have the right foundation, which is Christ. That's what the fire is going to reveal. Yep, all your works are burnt up. Pretty embarrassing. Hey, but your foundation is right. Your foundation is right. Praise God. Praise God your foundation is right. That's why he's saved, yet so as by fire. Now let me give you an example of this because you're all going to have wood, hay, and stubble. Okay? And there's nothing wrong in of itself, having those things, okay? As long as you also have the gold, silver, and precious stones, serving the Lord, okay? I'll give you an example of wood, hay, and stubble. Doing a 5,000-piece uh, uh, puzzle, you know, uh, you know, playing video games, you know, playing sports, you know, watching, watching the... Uh, what, what do you like? State of Origin. Yeah? It's not sinful, right? Just, just doing those kind of things. But it's wood, hay, and stubble. There's no eternal value in those things. And those things are going to be burnt up, okay? I think about my brother. My, my brother, um, he grew up, he had, he had a hobby. He used to um, put model airplanes together, you know, and model tanks and stuff like that. He liked that kind of stuff. And then as he got older, he, um, he built uh, radio control airplanes. So he'd control them and fly them around. And, um, and, you know, these are hobbies. They're not sinful in of it themselves, obviously. Uh, but, you know, it's wood, hay, and stubble. Let's admit it, right? It's just, it's wood, hay, and stubble. Like, it's good, but it's wood, hay, and stubble. But here's the thing. With all the skills and the things that he learned doing that, you know, he became an engineer, okay? Because, you know, everything that he learned exercised his mind. He got to practice a lot of things. He became an engineer. And now, you know, obviously, he provides for his family being an engineer, okay? Now, are we meant to provide for our family? Yeah. You know, is that a command of God? Absolutely. So you can see, even though... You know, he will get his rewards in heaven because he's providing for his family, he's providing for his needs, he's doing what the Lord's commanded of him. But many of the things that led up to doing that were just, you know, um, wood, hay, and stubble. Sometimes, like I said, it's not wrong in and of themselves, but directly there's no eternal value. But indirectly, there might be eternal value to those, to those things, right? You know, if I take, you know, I've taken my kids to watch soccer a few times. You know, it's, it's wood, hay, and stubble. You know, is it sinful to go and watch... No, you know why I take him? So I can have some dad and, and, and son time. You know, it doesn't matter who's playing. It doesn't matter who, who wins and who scores. If it's 0-0, it's just for them to remember, hey, remember that time dad took us out? That was awesome. Yeah, that was great. 
You know? Because why? Because I'm supposed to raise my kids, I'm supposed to show them that I love them, I'm supposed to show them, you know, it's not just, you know, regimented, you know, you know, homeschooling and you know, fun as well. And we'll see later on that God does want us to appreciate the things even in this world. Ooh, that sounds heretical. We'll see later on. Okay. Uh, verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, I could preach a whole sermon on this. Just, just a reminder that our body is the temple of God. Okay, keep it pure, keep it holy, keep it clean. Let's move on. Verse, th- verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man, man, any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. For it is written, remember what I told you? Whenever you see these words, for it was spoken or for it is written, go back and find out where it's written. Right? I had a look, it's in Job chapter 5, verse 13. And I'll just read it to you. It says, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. You know who said those words? Not Job. It was um, his friend Eliphaz. Eliphaz. Now, I thought there was nothing valuable in what these friends said. But apparently, there was at least one thing that this guy said that was valuable. Right? There was one thing that was inspired where, where Paul had to, you know, took that and put that in the New Testament. Okay, so what does that mean? He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. What that means is, God's obviously wiser than the, than the, than the so-called wise men of this earth, but the, the, the things that they devise, the things that they plan, the things that they think they're so smart at, God says will be their own destruction. Okay, God takes them at that and makes it that... Because what you see here... Like, I'll give you an example. Think of a reprobate. Think of someone that does not... Like, this, they think they're so wise... They think there's no God. They worship the creature more than the creator, like we see in Romans chapter 1. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. Okay, they think they're so good, they don't need God. What does God do? Okay, you think you're so wise? You think you don't want to need to retain God in, the, in your own knowledge? Then I'm giving you over to that reprobate mind. Yep, you can have that mind. You can go down the reprobate path, and I reject you. That's, that's God taking the wise in their own craftiness. The things that they create, God's going to use to turn the tables on them and make him fail, okay? One, of the, one really good example of this is in the book of Esther, and I'll just, you guys, I don't know if you, could, do you know the story of the book of Esther? Where basically um, Esther, who was a Jewish queen, uh, there was a guy called Haman. Haman, yeah, Haman, one of the bad guys. He wanted to kill all the Jews, and he creates these gallows. I'll just read it to you in Esther chapter 7, verse 10, very quickly. But Haman wanted to kill all the Jews. He wanted to kill Mordecai, who was Esther's um, uncle, and uh, he created these, these gallows so they, you know, the Jews would be hanged. And I'll just read to you Esther chapter 7, verse 10. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. So we see this man wanted to do a great evil, kill all the Jews, create these gallows. God makes it that even his own craftiness, the things that he's devised, would be his own downfall. He gets hanged himself and killed with his own devices. But then also in the book of Job there, where, where this, this passage is taken, verse 13, it also says, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. Now when I read that, I'm like, what in the world? And the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. I had to look it up a little bit. So obviously we know what counsel is. You're taking advice from someone. What's, what's someone that's froward? Someone that's kind of like an angry person. You know, it's not someone you can get along with. Someone that's very difficult. Okay? So if you take counsel for someone that's very difficult to deal with, you know, who's always angry, who's always upset, and you take counsel for them, it says that, uh, like, that counsel is carried headlong. That headlong means, um, I wrote it down, head, like reckless. Okay, if you take counsel from the wrong kind of people, it's going to make you reckless. It's going to cause you to be hasty with your decisions, and you're not going to, going to take the right paths. You know, God is basically saying, look, take wisdom from me, not wisdom from this world, not wisdom from man, because it's going to be your undoing. It's going to destroy you. It's going to destroy your life. Okay? Make, be careful of who you listen to. Be careful of the books that you read. I know there's a lot of like health, you know, um, self-help books. And like, I'm, I'm sure there's much truth in those things. But is it wiser than the Word of God? Do you think you're going to get more out of that than reading the Word of God and applying that to your life? 
Do you think you're going to get more out of that than having a fear of God, which is the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of knowledge? You know, if you're struggling in life and you need self-help, God's there to help you. Right. And maybe you need a bit of fear of the Lord so He can give you the wisdom and understanding so you can read the Word and apply it to your life. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 20. Verse 20. And again, so again, it's written again, it's written somewhere else, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. So it's just saying the Lord knows the, wise, the so-called wise men, their thoughts, the things that we think are great. Wow, great idea. God says it's vain. It's empty. You know, compared to his, his wisdom. And that comes from Psalm 94, verse 11. I'll just read it to you quickly. It says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. Okay? But just, just, I, the reason I just say that is I really want to encourage you. When you read the New Testament, it is written, it is spoken. Yeah, take a note of it. Where? Where is it written? Because you're going to get a lot more information as to what is being taught in the New Testament when you go back to the Old Testament. That's why it's there. So you can go back and say, oh, it's written where? Where? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. I'm almost done. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21. Therefore, therefore, now remember, this church is divided. This church is worshipping man. Therefore, I've just told you, we're nothing. You know, Christ is the foundation. We're serving the Lord. We're just ministers of God. The, the, the wisdom of the world is, is vanity. It's going to lead you astray. So all these truths that we've just learned, therefore, let no man glory in men. Let no man, and that's what, maybe another title for the sermon. Let no man glory in men. He's saying, stop glorying in me. Stop glorying in Apollo. Stop glorying in Cephas. Glory in God. But look what he says here. For all things are yours. All of it's yours. Look, verse 22. What, 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 is, what is theirs? Verse 22. Wherefore Paul and Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come are all yours. All are yours, it says. Right? So you got this group. Hey, we're, we, we, you know, Paul's ours. Hey, Apollos is ours. Peter's ours. No! These preachers be, all belong to you. All right? It's not just Apollos. It's Paul, Apollos and Cephas. They're yours. God's given these ministers to you so you can grow and learn from these people. Stop idolizing one guy. All these men of God are for your prophets. You know, and that's why I encourage you. I'm not a pastor that comes here and says, hey, you need to just listen to me. Stop listening to these other preachers. Stop listening to these other pastors. I encourage you. Okay, because I don't want to be this church. I don't want to be like this mindset where, you know, I'm, not that I'm afraid that you hear some other truth from someone else. It's fine. It's all for you. God's given you the ability. And, you know, thank God for the internet and things that we have now. We're weak. It's easy to access other preachers, other men of God, and, and listen to what they have to say. It's all for them. Okay, not just one of them. But look at verse 22. Wherefore, Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world, the world, or life or death or things present, or things to come, all are yours. All are yours. So it says the world. How do we, recti how do we, how do we um, reconcile this, right? With 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, which says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. How do we reconcile? Because, you know, that, that says don't love the world. But here Paul is saying, hey, the world's been given to you. It's yours. How do we reconcile these two things? Well, again, there's nothing sinful of the world in of itself. The, the, the Lord's created the world, right? The Lord's created all these things. And yes, you know, participating in certain things may very well be wood, hay, and stubble, but they may not necessarily be sinful in of themselves, okay? Now, I'll just finish reading 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, because it explains to us what part of the world we're not to love, okay? Verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those are the three things specifically about the world which we're not to love. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. You know, gay pride. That's of the world, you know. And no wonder, you know, they want to be proud. Out and, out and proud. Yeah, that's of the world, you know. God hates pride. God hates pride. But here's the thing. Look, can we love the world? Yeah. There are things about this world that God wants us to enjoy and love, okay? You know, one of the good things about the Sunshine Coast, one of the good things is, not, you know, the beaches, the lakes, the rivers. You know, I, I didn't have that where I was in Sydney. I was so far from it, you know. It was, it was too much work to go and have a swim, something like, you know, 
You know, that's a great thing. But you know, that's also one of the worst things about this place. Like, it's both good and bad, right? Why? Because, you know, you go to the beach and what? Women are walking around in their underwear. Men are walking around in their underwear, right? And I'm not to look at those. You know, I'm not, I'm not to, uh, you know, uh, I'm not to look on a maid in that sense. Why? That's the lust of the eyes. It's the lust of the flesh. Okay? Why are they dressed like that? It's the pride of life. Those are the things of the world that we're to avoid. Okay? And that's why I, I like the way you dress to church because it's nice. You know, it's not revealing like some other churches. You go to some other churches and women are dressed just like the world. They're dressed like they're going to a, to a club, you know, to pick up some guys or something like that, you know? No, that is the world which we're to avoid, okay? So there's nothing wrong with going to a beach if you find a, you know, a nice private place to go where you're not seeing all this, you know, I'll call it nudity, that's what I think it is. You know, I really go, you know, that's why I like going to that lake because there's, there's like where we do the baptisms because there's almost like no one there. Every now and again, someone turns up, it's like, oh man. But usually it's okay. Usually it's okay. You know, enjoying the, enjoy the world. You know, don't be a grumpy person. Enjoy life. It says here, all the world or life. God's given you your life so you can enjoy. It's yours. Okay, you don't have to be like the Amish, right? They're so afraid of the world, they won't even have electricity, they don't have a car, you know. Um, I don't know if you know what the Amish are, they're in the United States. You know, they're trying to keep themselves pure for the Lord, you know, because the world is so evil. No, the world's been given to them. Okay, the things to enjoy in this world, just make sure it's not sinful, okay? Make sure it's not sinful. Enjoy the things that God's given you. It says, of life or, or, or death. You say, why, why death? Well, if you keep reading on, it says, all things present, so the things present are for us, all things to come. So in death, there are things to come. And we can rejoice in that. We can, we can uh, look forward to those things. We can hope for those things. <clears throat> so, you know, don't, don't be so down on life. I, I know it's evil. I know, I know this world is evil. I, I know there's wickedness and I know there's, you know, look after your children. You know, there are pedophiles. There's all, there's all manners of wickedness. But don't get so upset because the Lord wants you to actually enjoy the world and enjoy life as long as it's pleasing to Him. Okay, as long as it's pleasing to Him. And then in verse uh, 23, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 23. And ye are Christ's, and this is the best bit, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is, is God's. So he's saying God's given us, you know, Paul, Paul Apollos, Cephas, he's given us the world, he's given us life, he's given the things now, he's given the things to come. That's what he's given to you, but don't forget you belong to Christ. Okay, you belong to Christ. That's why you're not to enjoy the pride of life and the, and the, and the, and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. You belong to Jesus Christ, and Christ belongs to God, his Father, um, you know, you're, you're eternally secure in the hands of God. Just remember, as you build on this foundation of Christ, that you keep in mind, yeah, the Lord's given us so much to enjoy, but you keep in mind, I belong to Jesus Christ. I've got to make sure that the things I do is pleasing to Him, is honorable to Him. That's going to be the easiest way for you to make decisions in your life. You know, you go, ah, you know, should I do this or should I do that? You know, does it please the Lord? Does God care about the soccer team? No. Nah. But do you think it pleases the Lord that I spend time with my kids and just have father and son time? Of course, you know, that's what the Lord wants us to do, right? Enjoy our family, raise our kids, nurture the kids. But that's, I know, but that's wooden, hay and stubble. <laughs> I, you know, I get it. But, you know, make sure you have a balance. Make sure you have the wood and the silver and the precious stones. And the easiest way, guys, is just to preach the gospel. That's what Paul was doing. That's what Apollos was doing. That's what we learn from here in, in this chapter. So let's pray.